we've known each other for for quite a while now and worked together for for many years but not for a while i think it was quite a while ago i think i was trying to think the last time we might have actually worked together on was that probably was it, that date, it, the jacobs it, ad it was a jacobs commercial wasn't it yeah, i remember yeah. you got, i remember you wrangled me a fine panavision hat oh yeah <laughs> which is, a bit which of, is bit still of uh, yeah 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 which is still, which is still which is still going strong actually though, good, good. yeah yeah thanks that was a good ad actually I was uh, born of its own um, frustrations in some parts of, uh, um, I, I remember, God, we had part two of that ad, didn't we? We ended up shooting again. I don't think I was available to shoot the second part. I oh, know. I, um, I don't think I did, yeah. I did the second part, but maybe we won't go into exactly why we had to reshoot it. But yeah, it was. A, <laughs> I think it was an interesting one, wasn't it? But yeah, nothing to do with us. I'm just going to put that out there, but it was a, it was a bit of politics going on. But yeah, no. Yeah, it came out really nice and it was a good little good little job, yeah. It was lovely director Peter Lighton, one of our favourites. Hi Peter. Excellent. <laughs> so just we'll kick it off with like how did you where's the beginning? Like what was the kind of yeah, first um, ever day on set as and how what what was your role as that? Yeah. So um so you my my journey was through the uh through the department. And um, back in uh, around about 1990, 1991, um, it was, I mean, the, uh, the, industry, the industry was pretty much <clears throat> still a closed shop. It was in many regards with the camera department as well. Um, it was, yeah, the industry was um, a bit of a closed shop. Uh, back in the day, and I was at university in Swansea, and I'd been making, um, I was a keen amateur photographer, and at university there was an AV, film slash AV, uh, room, wardrobe, cupboard, it wasn't a club, it wasn't a society, it had some equipment, um, it had a couple of Super 8 cameras, and amongst some other, so amongst some other sort of 80s video stuff, so um, myself and a couple of friends, Use the uh, started using this the Super 8 cameras and making surf films. Um, I'm a, always been a keen, a keen surfer, I think it was one of the reasons I went to Swansea University. And um, we made a couple of surf films, The Endless Winter was one, and uh, the other one was um, was a, a kind of surfing take on um, uh, on a Leone Western, and it was called <laughs> a, a, a Fistful of A Fistful of Rizzlers for a Few Spliffs More. <laughs> yeah very I don't, think had, I don't think i don't think it had much surfing in it i can't <laughs> remember really um but anyway great times but the uh so in my summer holidays um i got introduced to a uh and i can't even remember how the introduction came about but i got introduced to a lovely uh cameraman called freddie palombo um who was working uh <clears throat> who lived lived in uh, saint agnes in cornwall and freddie was had a commission to do about 90 five and 10 second bumpers for the channel West country over the whole summer. So basically he had free range on uh, creative and, uh, deli and execution. He just had to deliver this whole raft yeah. of bumpers. So it could be anything it could. And basically at the time it was H H T V. I think it was H something like that, or West Country, and it would go, boo, 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 and it'd be a potter on a wheel going like that, and there's, something would happen, and his pot would fall off, or it'd be like, doo, 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 and some seagulls would fly over, you know, a girl with an umbrella in the rain, or something like that. So it would make... <clears throat> with, 90 well, idents, kind of. Yeah, loads of them. Animals, loads right. of them. So, so Freddie had an SR, SR2, and um, he said, look, you know, do you fancy being my assistant? It's going to be you and me. We'll, we'll trundle around Cornwall in the back of, our Vol back of my Volvo, because I'll teach you how to load the film. I'll teach you all about the camera and, and you can watch me and we can hang out and see how it goes for a week. Yeah. And, uh, and as it was, I think we ended up doing maybe two and a half months and it was epic. So, so throw, like thrown in at the deep end then. Yeah, so yeah, it was very much. Although I, I, I do remember canning up the rushes in the rain in the back of the Volvo while he like swanked off for a glass of Rioja and, and like, you know, <laughs> basking in his glory. And I was thinking, oh, maybe that's where I want to be doing. Yeah. Maybe <laughs> and uh, it was brilliant. So, um, so Freddie, he really fired me up. Yeah. I sort of came out of that summer and was like, shit, you know, this is like, 
you know, there's creative people who, you know, are using, you know, film cameras and, you know, there's a, there's a structure, there's a department. I had no idea. So, um, and what, and what, then, year, what year was this? That was 1990, that was 1992. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Or 1990, yeah, 1992. And then the next year, 93, the same thing in the summer, um, I met, um, uh, uh, Richard Greatrex, uh, BSC, who has forever been my, um, I've forever been a thorn in his side, and he's forever been my, <laughs> my surrogate father, become <laughs> mentor, champion. Um, so Richard was uh, down in um, uh, Cornwall recceing for Blue Juice, and right. they were looking for a, ostensibly they're looking for a camera car driver. So Pat Garrett. Grip extraordinaire. Yeah. Um, interviewed me in the in the pub, and um, I had some limited experience, very limited. I had no idea about how the structure of a film camera department worked. Right. Um, but I had a passion, and he said, "Was I any good at woodwork? Because we we're going to like dry hire a seven and a half ton truck, and we had to we had to build a dark room and make it, make it into a camera car." <laughs> <laughs> I said I was good with gaffer tape and a hammer, and good. I think that was it. So. Um, so I sort of went on to Blue Juice as a, a camera trainee um, slash camera card driver under the amazing sort of tutelage of uh, Richard Greatrex, Brad Lana was a focus puller, um, Steve Sadler was a clapper loader, Pat Garrett was a grip, um, Roy Branch was the gaffer. Um, it was an incredible group of people to be thrown. That was thrown in at the deep end. So that was right, my yeah. first. And I literally, I was living in Cornwall. I sort of finished that job and thought, Oh, man, I might have to move out of Cornwall now. I might, have to come up. <laughs> I might have to come up to the big smoke. Give up the surf. Yeah, well, never give up the surf, but do something like that. And so Brad said, you know, well, Richard said, I mean, the job went, the job was amazing. It was, it was an amazing job, you know, we worked in Cornwall. Then I ended up blagging myself onto the unit that did the water photography in Lanzarote, which was hilarious. Um, yeah, we, I mean, it was just amazing. Danny Cohen was on that. He was loading. Um, he was loading one of the water unit, water water cameras, um, and so I met some extraordinary people who've yeah. been sort of lifelong friends. And uh, Sam Renton, actually, Sam, Sam was Sam on that. Yeah, Sam was on that. Sam Renton was um, maybe Sam was trainee. Oh, God, I can't remember. Um, or second loader. He might be second loader. But anyway, Richard took me on then as his trainee. He was like, right, two years, you're going to work, you know, we'll get you going as a trainee. He goes, I strongly advise you to work with as many different people as you can. Yeah. Um, and when, when we think, you've, you know, you're up to speed, then I'll tell you to sort of to, to fuck off and go and work with other people. Why the next? Like, what, really? And, and then maybe, and then maybe, you know, come back. Anyway, Richard continues to be a, a you know, a huge figure in my life. And, um, and uh, you know, I'm forever grateful for the, for the opportunities in, in not just in uh, um, progression through a, a department, which was no no meal ticket, you know, yeah. it was uh, I had to um, I had to you know like us all. It only fits a certain I think personality with passion and and drive. Um, but I loved it, sucked it in, and that was that was the start. So then Richard took me, started taking me on as his camera trainee, and and you know and with those guys, you know, Pat with Brad. Um, it wasn't long before you meet other people and, yeah. and then you just start, your tree starts growing, your, yeah, your network of, of uh, hope, hopefully people who might want to work with you and give you, a, give you a shot. But was Richard able to kind of take you on from next film to next film as he kind of moved on and yeah. throughout that and train you up in that way? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, we went through, so I did... God, I can't remember the jobs at the time, all of them. Yeah. But the, um, it was pretty much two. I, I mean, I, I remember sort of almost two years to the dot. And Sam was his loader at the time, Sam Renton. And uh, um, Sam was very much embedded, obviously, with Richard as well. And I was thinking, well, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to get a shot because, uh, you know, you know, obviously Sam's um, You've amazing, got wait, he's number one. But wait for so, the lap to run up. Yeah. So sort of through, um, I ended up, once I was probably done my two years, I ended up then doing dailies on extra um extra cameras for um for likes of various other uh, uh people i've met along the way over those two years and sort of slowly getting my shot and then 
Richard saw me doing that. I think I did a job with Nina, for Nina Kelburn, a lovely Nina, who's who's a very dear friend. Um, uh, with Julian Butler, actually, I think Julian. I think it was a short film that Julian won. Julian won the first film. Julian Focus Pool, and um, so Julian, and that was it. Yeah, I did something with Julian. Nina gave me a shot on that, and then Julian took me on to do a a feature film um, as his loader, and then Richard saw that and Richard was like, okay, I see what you're doing now. And I went back to pretty much being Richard's full-time loader. Um, and Sam had moved on. Sam was, I think Sam had started focus pulling by that point. And then, um, I don't know, I can't remember. Maybe Anyway, Richard took, Richard took me on and, um, you know, Richard had various focus pullers, uh, uh, Mark Milson and um, uh, Brad and uh, JJ O'Dedra um and to name to name a few yeah uh, so so richard didn't particularly have you know i mean you know it's everything's fluid isn't it you know sometimes oh, sometimes people aren't available so that's other opportunities but I, I pretty much stayed with richard and went from film to film uh things like shakespeare in love and all that stuff but by that point even by shakespeare in love i probably done my time loading and i all i was so enamored and fascinated by the uh, um, uh, the technical process and the creative um, uh, expression that seemed to be obvious through the work as a being a cinematographer yeah um, I, I, I thought wow this is all I want to be and I was still very much an amateur photographer and I start I actually started to do some fashion photography of my own right and uh, and as a photographer, I enjoyed that autonomous control, you know, from the, you know, from the uh, creative to the art direction. And yeah. uh, and then you don't quite have that as a cinema, you know, in filmmaking, but the collaborative experience of filmmaking and being yeah. on the set was what really fired me up. I really enjoyed being around like minded people. Um, so, you know, Richard championed me taking the cameras, you know, for the weekend, all the, all those things you're not supposed to do. I don't know if you probably do now, but I think I even took but taking a couple of short ends. I think I think I even drove the I think I even drove the camera truck away on one Friday night with full two cameras, steady cam. Went and shot went and shot a music video at the weekend with short ends, and uh, that maybe I might have creatively accounted for. And then um, <laughs> and then then I seem to remember <laughs> seem to remember. Sending the uh, sending all the, the short ends into Clyde Noakes at Deluxe the following week, and then trying to scramble to intercept the beta copy as it came back to the production <laughs> office, labelled camera tests. And yeah. I think I think I did a bunch of music videos and uh, short films that way, and um, and on that process met met uh, at the time I was still young, but met young um, aspiring directors, you know, who might be working within. Um, within other departments on films and dramas in their own way, you know, in the production department, you know, people, runners who are hoping to be, you know, who want to be directors, some, some people in the uh, camera department, um, propmen, any, anybody actually, there's always a bunch of people, not necessarily people at that stage who'd come through film school. There wasn't really, there was obviously the National Film School, but it was a different thing. Right. The whole, the whole, um, I say kind of explosion of um, opportunity and inclusivity through um, graduate film courses was just sort of starting. It wasn't, it wasn't as, um, it was in no way, I don't think established. So, so there were, there weren't things like, you know, and, there, and it was obviously before the internet and stuff. So there wasn't things like shooting people. You couldn't just get a network of yeah. like-minded people. So, Circles tended to be quite small, um, and, 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 and within, within the the film industry, and within the, and within the film industry, yeah. yeah. I mean, I was always lucky enough to have worked in uh, commercials all my life as well. So yeah. I'd always been whoring myself around Soho, uh, you know, as a, as a loader. Um, so actually, the, you know, Soho and the the commercials world at the time when I was in my mid twenties was hugely vibrant and there was loads of opportunities like you used to be able to shoot a test commercial there might be like a 
you know, a young creative team, for example, yeah, a copyright art director might might have had a number of scripts passed over over that particular year, and whatever year, whatever part time it was in the year, there might be a little bit of cash at an agency left, and they might have said to this, you know, maybe a certain production company had been doing some work, and and then that production company has just taken on a, a new director, and the director hasn't got much weight on their reel, and they'd be they'd approach the agencies to uh, see if there are any test scripts. So there'd be a small budget, you know, and at the time it was always under 10 grand, but it might be, remember it might have been six or four, four to eight grand, which was loads of money to do something at that time. Yeah. And, and you get these, you get a script for, I, I think I remember doing one for, for Levi's, Levi's jeans. It was an awesome, it was an awesome test commercial with a, a guy, uh, Bobby Leslie, who was working at a company, Oh God, I don't know if it was Ivan Southern. I can't remember where it was then, actually. So long ago. But but I remember we were able to basically have a little bit of cash and we sh- we could do whatever we want. So, you know, we shot, everything was shot 16 mil pretty much those days. So I was, you know, generally, unless you had some budget, 35. Yeah. But we'd, um, I remember we shot 60 mil, but we cross-processed it. You know, I had some black and white stock. We had some transparency stock. We, you know, drove, um, uh, Oh God, who was it? So images. Roger drove him absolutely demented, sending him all, all these different. Let's pull, pull, process that. Pull, push, process that. Nah. He's going. You got no money. Went. Oh come on, why should be fine? Yeah. You know, and um, and so we we that was it. So I'm sort of digressing from where it all started, but no, no, it yeah. was a continuation of. It was an energy and a passion into with the, the department gave you, and I, I think I'd always say to, um trainees coming in and these days i think there's a lot of uh i'm not i'm not saying there's a, sh- a shortcut mentality but I, I find that sometimes people feel being embedded in a role for a certain amount of time causes restriction and doesn't allow them to move through into what they want to be doing but i've always said look you can be doing whatever you want to be doing yeah but maybe keep quiet about it if you don't want you know sometimes other people might want, not want to hear about you know how you've been making the best film ever over the weekend and what have you so just yeah. keep you you know just be careful how you how you communicate your aspirations and meet like-minded people but in the camera department being a second ac or a clap loader as it was more at the time um was an amazing platform and opportunity to re- it was like your own film school because once you knew your job and you could do it well and yeah. look after your you know look after your department look after your cinematographer look after the paperwork know all the equipment start to learn more about the optics more about the cameras have the trust of the focus puller yeah. once you once you were doing all that rather than being bored it was the most amazing platform to be on set you know if you're on a film set you you literally standing there with a board minding your own business chatting up some mope up yeah. or something like that. but you you'd be there and you'd be you'd have this conduit of information from like directors talking to producers yeah. talking to cinematographers talking to production designers talking to actors you'd hear the act the actors would trust you because you'd been on set for the last month yeah. or so with them so they they wouldn't mind having a conversation directly with a cinematographer or with a with a director in front of you and, you, and you're there so you you know because you're in the front line you're there yeah. with your board you're there with your tape you're doing your thing you know if you're accepted in, as as we are and you're doing your job and then you've just got this wonderful sponge like platform to yeah. really learn about filmmaking as it's happening you know as it's really happening i think um, i think i had a very like a, a very similar kind of experience you know what i mean like i finished film school and I we had a, I had a great mentor at film school Tim Dodd who was a who was a, a focus puller and he kind of went to he became the technician at our school and uh he kind of said to me look you can either you've got two roads you can do you can go out and just you know say you're a cinematographer and you know you've got this you've got some stuff that you've shot at film school that you know is you know it's not great but it's all right and you can start building on that but you're gonna you're gonna struggle for a bit do you know what I mean you're gonna be you know, living off beans you're going to be doing a lot of free projects and you're going to be making a lot of mistakes yourself do you know what i mean or you can go down the other route and you know start crewing and you're going to work 
you know, if you're a good crew member, like you said, you're going to start working with some of the best cinematographers in the world and just watch and soak, like you said, soak it in like a sponge. And, in, you know, when you're on set, that's, that, like you said, that's, I felt like some of the directors I work with now, I, I just met them on set. They were runners or, like you said, yeah. or um, ADs or that kind of thing. Yeah. And you're not going to ever meet those people just wandering around the streets trying to be a DP. Like it's and all, a good also, you know, the, the other thing, the other thing you have, the other wonderful opportunity you have is that you have a relationship with all the rental houses. Yeah. So all the, all the time that you've invested with jo- with all the jobs you've done, there comes a point where arguably you've probably got a great relationship with all the rental houses. Yeah. So when it comes a time that you go that you're shooting, you'll generally be supportive. And obviously we're all careful where we put our favors. And we yeah. don't, none of us want to be sort of used and, and we all, you know, we all probably feel we have been at some point, but the, um, you know, essentially you, you have that relationship that you've built up, which is a priceless relationship when you're, when you're starting to develop your reel and way beyond that. But, you know, it's, um, it's a, it's a wonderful, it is a wonderful opportunity to be in the department and to be growing as a cinematographer. There's no, yeah. there's no reason why anyone should be afraid of that route and thinking, thinking, okay, I have to, I have to do X, you know, loader, focus puller, operator, and away we go. If that's going to be my route, you know, for me, it was like, I kind of felt like I was the world's longest loader. Yeah. And, and I use my time to, you know, create my own film school. You know, my own passion in sort of, you know, as a, as a cinephile was, was that was all open to me through the BFI, through meeting people, you know, access to world films and technology growing. You, you know, you gradually, yeah, you gradually become more mature and, um, and maybe, uh, you know, you 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 you're growing as a you're growing as a filmmaker yeah. with your with your contacts. So it's a yeah that was that was my that was my route. But I I think when it came to saying well what do I do at this point? You know, do I say I'm a cinematographer or do yeah. I continue? I'd been I was then focus pulling and I've been focus pulling for um, I think maybe two or three years done a bunch of work film yeah. uh a bunch of films tony Immy, who's uh not with us anymore very sadly he was amazingly supportive um richard obviously nina and uh and then job you know days jobbing with everybody um yeah. for um yeah it was actually it's probably it's probably more than two years probably but basically okay there came a point and i, I remember i got offered a, a long job um that was going to be, it would be away for a big chunk of the year. And I remember thinking, this is the time to sort of make the break, really. Right. And um, and so I, you know, naively said to the producer when I was called up, I just went out on a limb and said, look, it's, it's great. And his producer called me up rather than a, um, rather than a cinematographer. It was for a, I was doing the visual effects units at the time. Right. Um, uh, myself and Merritt Gold, uh, lovely Merritt, and um, and it was for a VFX unit on a film. It was great. It would have been good fun and, and uh, what have you. But I remember saying, "Look, I, I'm actually crossing over now. You know, I'm going to, I'm sort of going to put my you know chips and cards on the table and say I'm you know I'm going out as a working cinematographer." Um, if there are any ex with you know any additional days on the visual effects <laughs> unit, I could blah 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 blah. Yeah, uh, you know some operating, and uh, they were very supportive, and I never heard from them again. Um, but the uh, but the, the you know they wished me well, and then yeah. I was like I was like right oh shit okay I've done that, and I was with Annie's diary service at the time, and I remember calling her up and uh, saying look, I think I've got to like ditch the diary service. I'm going to have to. Um, go you know uh, yeah. sort of go sort of covert ops and make this work so i ditched my diary service i stopped on you know made people aware that i was crossing over and then really threw myself at um at anything and everything that came along i mean financially to survive i ended up working more as a photographer in that time um 
to some editorial work and a bit of fashion work and yeah. uh, that provided a little bit of money but the money pretty much went into making short films and yeah, yeah. doing test commercials so i'd say from then it probably took five years to really get going you know to really you know to get to a point where um I then have a, an, an agent and uh, yeah. and I seem to be working. And at that point, it was in commercials rather than in, rather than in long form. I kind of settled into a, a jobbing commercial world, which is which is wonderful. I mean, yeah. you know, which is which is great. I was very lucky. Was the, was the end goal long form? Was it always yeah. the beginning? You always wanted to be a long form. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And but it was like the the path that revealed itself yeah. was the um, was the commercial. Was commercial world, and it was actually some of the you know older school um, production companies. Uh, um, uh, Philip Thomas, Thomas Thomas, who, you know, gave me opportunities with yeah. you know with mature and experienced directors. I felt for these guys and girls that I sort of was put with, thinking, "God, oh, what do I have to offer?" But it was obviously, <laughs> it was obviously sort of you know maybe passion and maybe looking at the world slightly differently. And I think that's what people are always interested in, and especially when you're starting out. You're not clouded you kind of had the eyes maybe of a child so you can sort of you can offer something really exciting so yeah, um so i had some great opportunities to work with some great directors and then settled into i guess working with you know new relationships with young directors coming through from film school and and uh, and then bouncing into i guess that pop promo world which it was yeah. at the time as well so it was kind of promos promos and commercials but it was wonderful you know i had the energy for it you know i was like young enough to sort of work those hours and, and you know keep going so that was um yeah that, I think, that was I, think I can remember you i think remember us discussing that you kind of got into a good connection with um the one direction crew like when that kind oh, of yeah. Picked yeah, off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, yeah. Ben Winston and the yeah. guys, guys at Fullwell. So many Fullwell, were amazing. It. Yeah. And I yeah, mean, with that, that, were those guys that you kind of knew and then that kind of kicked off and you, because I think no, you've done it, um, I got to, uh, got to know them very quickly. They were just, they were just starting out as a collective, if you yeah. like. Um, there was Ben, uh, Gabe and Ben, two brothers and the three, three guys together. And, um, like football nuts they are or football right, nuts. Yeah. And, and and they made um what they made the something of 96 they made a football yeah, film yeah, yeah, yeah. and um and then they they become very good friends with uh um uh people in that world and got going as a production company and then quickly somehow had a relationship with Simon Cowell's company and a kind of um a trusted relationship so a lot rather than record commissioners um different record commissioners coming through to production companies they they pretty much i guess took let's say the x factor work and making a few yeah. you know single so so they slowly slowly built up a relationship with uh psycho and bmg or whatever it was at yeah, the yeah. Time and, um, and uh and i just now i just got i i um actually ben winston who's now doing a show with James Corden over in the, the States. Yeah. He went over there, the Late Late Show. Um, ben had seen an art house film. I, so around 2009, I was starting to work with Joanna Hogg, which, is, which has been, seems to be an amazing relationship. And, um, and uh, very particular films, they're quite divisive. But right. um, uh, Ben had seen an art house film that I'd done call it art house he'd seen a feature film i'd done and um and uh it was nothing at all to do with a one direct in, in no way it <laughs> married up creatively but i got a call through my uh through my agent and um said he wanted to have a chat so we just met that way uh but we we got on and then we just um at the time his production company was just really starting up so they they weren't really looking to work with loads of different people they just wanted to build relationships so yeah um there was an opportunity there to we just ended up doing a bunch of work together yeah one direction it was quite and they were, they were sort of almost coming to the zenith of their of their career uh one direction at the time so it's quite a heady 
yeah potent time to be doing i really enjoyed it actually i really enjoyed hanging around those guys those kids they're brilliant yeah yeah it was a lovely it was a lovely world and lovely energy to be a part of yeah and now you're you uh you're very fixed in the kind of you know long form you do a lot of dramas and features yeah. you, you seem to like looking at your, your work there's a there's a fair bit of period drama in there i mean yeah. is that something that you aimed for fell into again or what's the i think um it's funny isn't it you don't want to be i don't think anyone wants to be <coughs> no one would want to be yeah tied into yeah. a genre but you know if you're a, say if you're a photographer you're very much known and work through your your style and your your style comes from you your creative expression your aesthetic the way you communicate um a story and an emotion to um, a viewer and audience and so you know if you're looking to hire a photographer you very much would go for you know someone who has a, let's call it a look yeah and and at the moment in my commercials world you know we start I do I work uh, I guess considerably with uh, fashion photographers um, as yeah. their work went digital there was a kind of a bringing together of the still image with a um, a moving image. It could be for anything, but a client would want to maybe shoot with a talent on the same day. They might want some, to do some content for point yeah. of sale screens, or it might be an idea for a perfume commercial or just something. Sometimes yeah. they didn't even have an idea, but you'd have to start with the lighting and the lighting at the end, which would be the film and then sort of back time it to the image. So yeah. they they were resistant at the time, photographers, and rightly so. They didn't want, you know, but it was really interesting experience because very much all those those um, guys and girls that I worked with there, the, the most important thing is the with the lighting is their identity or what they're known <laughs> as, and you can't you can't you 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 have to sort of religiously help them achieve their look. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and I love it. It's really exciting because they all, they, each of them is a different approach to like contrast, color and, yeah. and, uh, and depth and shadow, but it's, but they can vocalize it and it's very clear. So it's, it, it's, so that's, that's one thing. And then as a cinematographer, um, you know, I guess if you had the luxury of, you know, you had, you know you're 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 known as this you're that you're that guy that's great but yeah you might, unless you are unless you have a certain heritage behind you you're not going to be picking and choosing your jobs so yeah. as a filmmaker i would like to think that you're there's a much broader world view which is your approach to the, if you start with genre you know which is you know has some kind of tropes and um expectations of the sort of uh, creative execution in 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 visual language you know it's like you know how you approach a a, a a noir it could be a domestic noir these days or a classic noir or or how you approach a melodrama or how would you approach a period drama or, or do you subvert it and all these things then but to do all those things you really have to have an, a, a knowledge of of all those genres and then maybe your sense of your style I mean you know someone like you know Barry Atkord is beautifully yeah. identifiable in um in his in you know in his lighting and his operating storytelling you know you yeah. can see Barry's work and but I would say I wouldn't say it's few and far between but you can really identify you know you can yeah. see Barry's work and just go boom bingo yeah. you know it's amazing um and maybe for a lot of the rest of us you know the opportunity might come let's say it did for me to do some period work it did yeah. on maybe on victoria but yeah. that work then is seen by other people who go oh yeah give me the give me the victoria guy or one of the one of the many there's obviously you know john lee beautifully uh, set that up um and uh you know you become you you then get more opportunities for a little while in that field yeah but then probably like all of us you're mindful of it and you're trying to resist it you don't want to go well i don't you know that's not my thing you know what i've always really been into is a more sort of expressionistic aesthetic you know i like a sort of 
a grittier naturalism with the light or maybe i like more stylized lighting and or maybe i like sort of unmotivated lighting yeah but whatever it is you might be hoping that those scripts come in and they might do but they might not do but you know in the meantime something else like a psychological drama might come in or yeah you know so um yeah i, I definitely got on a little bit of a roll with the period stuff and there's a certain um like anything you know what the great thing about doing shooting commercials is you quickly work out that you're not going to reinvent the wheel you know yeah. like you know lighting a hair commercial involves a certain approach lighting a car commercial involves a certain approach and lighting a beauty commercial involves a certain approach and a food commercial yeah. you, know, you know all those things they get very specific and um and it's the same um the same i noticed with or i quickly noticed after doing period work you start getting that experience of knowing the dynamic of the day you know the importance of um uh, costume and makeup and working you know your 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 scheduling decisions of the day yeah around the sort of the dynamic of this beast that moves at a certain pace yeah um so you know that's the, the you know the visual language aside just the practicalities of working in that environment um i mean you know. do you feel like there is a scope to kind of um step outside of some of those boundaries sometimes or do you think it's always kind of you've got to kind of just play it with with what the director's hoping to get and that kind of thing because you look at something say like the favorite you know that really yeah it kind of changed you know and obviously it's one in a million you know there's a haystack yeah. and everything and then, but then you look at you look at Yorvis's work on like you know the lobster and uh um and and previously and you realize okay i get i'm sure you know and robbie's work you know the two of them together yeah, and you 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 look, you know, you know, there's going to be something exciting there. You know, instantly, Ooh, yeah. you know, for me, it was that the way that um, it felt like each character had their own camera, as far as a, a sense of a visual language. Like, you know, there's no obviously no complementary, no no complementary single. It's you know, one single might be like that way and low, and the other one might be on a different focal length and up there. Yeah. Beautiful, you know, so so liberating and then you know Sophia Coppola's work on uh Marie Antoinette was was kind of um I don't know if groundbreaking is the right word I think the favorite is but the but Marie Antoinette again took you know kind of tried to subvert those those period tropes and I, I I think that would be my that would be for me an exciting part of approaching period I think it'd be for anybody yeah you know you you, you know you want to put um a sense of your own sort of epoch on uh on these things um because maybe you know the themes are universal aren't they generally yeah. and so so to bring them up to date is always the thing you know are you doing a you know a, a um oh good what was it, what was it that tony pierce roberts who used to work for uh, merchant ivory-esque yeah, yeah. approach or or is it or is it or is it something that that is has a sense of an auteur, a sense of authorship, you know, like Yorgos's work, you know, the uh, something like the favourite. Yeah, I mean, how does that does that approach for you? Like, say you, you've got this script, it's come through, say something like Victoria or Vanity Fair. I mean, where does it start with you? Is it is it always a you know a conversation with the director? Do you bring things to them, or do you like to kind of listen and see what they've got to say first? I think I, I generally take a punt. Yeah, and I think um, I think uh, um, I sort of worked out. I think as a cinematographer, you would be very clear about the sense of intent you're giving. Um, it can be like if you're asked a direct answer, do you think you know how long is this going to take? You know, yeah. do you think do you do you think it would be better this way, or do you think we do you think we need this shot? Right. Yeah. I think in those situations, the worst thing you can do is hesitate. Because I think directors they generally see that and they, oh, they don't want that because they all the voices in their head, in voices in their world are coming, you know, left, right, centre, and front from you know producers, you know, actors, um, uh, and their own their own pressures. So so I find find that quite often, you know, even if you're not 100 percent sure yourself, it's good to just be direct and go. It's going to be 20 minutes or. It's going to be like yes, yeah. I do think yes, I do think we need that, and then try and work out why afterwards. It's like shit, we do need it anyway. We're I doing it now. So there is, do it. We're like, doing it now, so let's do it quickly. Yeah, and, I think uh, there is a lot of like 
I find it definitely that, you know, as, mu as much as a, you know, a persona, a director can put out in terms of, you know, confidence and surety, they do lean on, you know, cinematographers a lot of the time as like, you know, a second kind of wind of like help, you know, like. Yeah, very much so. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's right and just and the, um, and it's exciting. Well, yeah, I just mentioned that. So when you, when you kind of start a project off at the beginning, you, you, are you bringing your ideas to the table? Are you I'd like to bring, you know, lookbooks or for a director, oh, yeah. or that kind yeah, of thing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, ab absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So um, exactly that. Yeah, I think I'd go out on a punt, um, either at an interview stage or, yeah. um, you know, these days. And then, you know, you I, uh, express a reaction um, to, how, to how a script resolved towards your own, um sense of a an aesthetic your own sense of of how you would realize that um and uh and then try and make it clear you know with with as you say tonal references through you know nobody's trying to ape anything but obviously references are a large part of yeah of uh getting some clarity as to um what you're doing and also i think uh directors um always want to feel that you have a breadth in understanding visual language so you know um being able to reference doesn't mean you're, you're copying or aping or homage but you can start talking about a style how you see something whether it's in terms of in both terms of of, uh, of a dynamic with the camera and uh and where the lighting is being led from or what you're trying to say yeah the lighting or how you might how you might approach the storytelling um yeah and are you are you someone who very much likes to lead that kind of the, the you know the camera movement or the lighting very much in the direction of the story and like and, and use those kind of tools as a way to um you know emphasize parts of the story yeah yeah very much so i think I'll, you know there's a, there's a fine line isn't there between um uh being camera conscious or lighting conscious or not yeah. you know the, I, I loved a, a job did last year called little birds um uh which is uh yeah. coming out of sky atlantic that's very much a the execution of that is very much in line with a traditional melodrama of a kind of cirque or fast binder yeah. lighting style okay and the, the lighting is very is unmotivated it's emotional it's an emo you know it's an but it's more more than emotional it's a sensory experience so right. it's really a trip the whole thing really is and it's um you know you can uh you know you can drink the kool-aid and really enjoy it and really you know go to town with that but there was a very rigorous set of rules uh stacy passon is a mate, wonderful director to work for um and uh you know very conscious that you know like many directors that if you're going to do something stylized it, the the star can't overtake the grammar it has to yeah has to uh um it, it has to We're intertwine it has to be entwined yeah it has to be in, in, in infused through it and it has to live and it has to breathe it and you can see it and you can identify it because it is i mean little birds is really really stylized you know it's like very unmotivated lighting you know but it makes sense because it's because the the rules are clear and then right. there's a progression of those rules through the story it's like you know do you, you have a you know a progression there's always a progression of the visual language. You don't hit it, but we don't hit, you know, if you hit something on, you know, in the first act of a film or in the first, you know, I don't know, the first sort of demi act, then, then that, then that is for a stylistic point in itself. But otherwise, you know, things maybe grow as, as maybe the audience, you know, gets to feel things as regarding the story yeah. and the characters. And, okay. and, and I guess it's your own approach to how you, want to tease or how you want to reveal or how you want to resolve those things with the camera and with the lighting so with that like the kind of um you, you were talking about unmotivated lighting and that kind of thing and did you take it down kind of color routes or were you 
kind of just bringing in sources from different directions and uh it was the the it's very character led so right. uh, on little birds so as the char- so the, the story the story is about subjugation and restriction and then emancipation and uh growth and freedom uh growing into oneself so you know so you know we we started with key lighting characters yeah. in a in a kind of maybe naturalistic sense motivated by window light wrapping around uh um kind of direct directional soft sources it was you know it was yeah there was a sense of direction but it was kind of wrapping and then went completely into as it progressed the progression was almost like the lighting came round, and it almost came round fashion frontal right um you know with a kind of it's it's period set in the 50s with a kind of almost like grace kelly hitchcockian arc light three-quarter frontal light um or even on the nose you know classic sort of on the nose frontal light so very you know and you can't be you know that sort of lighting is unmotivated in the natural world so then you you know the world around that key lighting was embedded in color in this instance right okay which yeah. went back which was a which was a sort of a started with references to films like lola fassbinder's lola you know so where every other flurry tube in a in a you know, in an office, it could be like green or it could be pink, you know, yeah. or it could be blue. It didn't, but there is, whatever it is, there was a re, you know, there there was a reason that you could vote, you know, that you could you could work out what these colour meant. So we had identified colours related to characters, and then as characters, as the two central characters, um, protagonists uh, moved um, through their own story. The there was a sort of a colour shift accordingly through their sort of awakening and their awareness and their sense of growing empowerment within themselves. Um, you know, and I think that's, you know, what I love about psychological work is yeah. when you play with uh, s- stories that have, that focus on sort of shifting realities and maybe identities reducing and segueing and moving, it really gives an opportunity to, um, to not be entrenched in a particular lighting setup yeah. you know you can you can be you know you can as long as you have your you know maybe your rules and it's going in a certain way you you have a freedom with color and with direction and hard and with soft to to sort of embed and tell your story yeah i mean and with that kind of lighting are you someone that likes to kind of have it all very mapped out you know plots and that yeah. kind of thing or are you are you kind of working with the gaffer in a sense of like i want this kind of feeling and you hand over some of that responsibility to them like how do you kind of yeah. like to, to work it i love i love to have a relation you know I, the best relationships with uh, gaffers have always been when they've been as impassioned as yourself yeah and then you then you then it's wonderful to see them fly with the um with the setting up, the pre-lighting, the roughing in of sets. And when you come in and it's like on the money, it's like, okay, it's <laughs> brilliant. You know, that's amazing because they actually, there's an understanding of the story. Yeah. Um, yeah. Rather than, rather than, and that's the biggest thing. It's like, are people understanding the story? And if, if they, you know, it's the same thing with, with gripping as well. Yeah. You know, it's best when there's, when there really is an appreciation and a knowledge of, what you're trying to say with the camera and what you're trying to say with the lighting yeah so um i very much do uh yeah lighting plans which um obviously start at a recce uh and then i have lot you know you know involve images and references to to my gaffer to try and explain the aesthetic that i'm looking for with that lighting plan yeah um but the lighting plan generally generally you start start a job with a series of plans for every set and every location. Okay. Um, but I think, you know, what I then probably do is I deconstruct. So I, I tend to start with with something quite formal as a plan. Yeah. And that's just not, you know, that's also budget related, you know, if you need machines and you're planning for all this kind of thing. Yeah. But, I tend to find on the day, once the staging, once we see the staging, I might feel very differently. You know, suddenly you might want to something 
that you, you wouldn't dream of putting the actors in front of the window or windows. Suddenly there's an angle and what the actors are doing in the staging with the director, you think, oh, wow, this is beautiful. And you just end up without even realising it, you've completely changed your lighting your lighting plan. Not, yeah. your, not your creative expression, but you've, you've changed that plan. And, you know, but, you know, what I think is very rigorous with a plan is that it just means that you don't need to waste time by having lumieres and on set that you're not going to use. Yeah, yeah. You know, I don't, I don't like having stuff standing around that I know I'm not going to use because I just think it's just taking someone half an hour to get out of the truck and bring it up and they could have been yeah. doing something else. Yeah, yeah. I could say, I ain't ever going to use that because I don't bring it up. Go, yeah. well, why have we got it there? I go, I don't know. I didn't ask for it. <laughs> but it <laughs> seems to be here anyway. Put it back. <laughs> I think it's good, yeah. I think I always seem to definitely, I, I you know, like you, like you said, always plan it out and always have references based on that that plan and I share them before I mean you know I don't do so much long form so it's not so rigorous I do a lot more commercials where you know it, it it's you, you kind of need tricks up your sleeve sometimes unfortunately yeah. where I know in the long form game you can very much plan out you know we're definitely going to need these amount of fixtures and this is what we're going for um but I was saying you know I I feel like I like to plan it out but then almost you know share that pre you know in pre-production but then maybe leave that at the door and then walk into the set with it all planned. But like you said, let those kind of natural things just happen. Do you know what I mean? And let it, yeah. let it evolve on set when you, when it can, definitely. Yeah, I think it's good. It's good at times, you, you know, to share it with the first AD. Yeah. You no, know, not not religiously, but, you know, if you've got a particular setup and you're, you're trying to communicate the fact, not just with pre-lighting and stuff, you're just trying to make someone aware that, look, there's going to be this amount of gear involved in this day. Or yeah, this. yeah. You know, there's going to be a bit more labour on set. There's going to be a bit more people. It's going to be might be a bit more noisy as they're setting up, or it might not be. Maybe maybe we're going to go. You know, maybe the first AD might be presuming in the scheduling that you know this day exterior, what have you, is going to use the same amount of lighting that you've talked about. But actually, for that part of the story, you might be you might be doing you might not really have anything. Like literally, you have nothing. Yeah. So so I think it's good to it's good to in in the planning, you know carefully communicate um maybe broadly but having some having some plans just to just to bounce in and show other people outside your department what you're what you're thinking is uh is, is can, be, can be a positive thing yeah i think i think i wanted to touch on something that you said earlier with about the grip and how you know i think it's quite a overlooked thing in this modern day you know in now with the, you know younger dps maybe coming up i don't think i feel like you know, the grip maybe is slightly, I don't know, overlooked, but then they're, they're slightly maybe looked at less of like a a creative role, but, and more of like a, you know, push the dolly, you know, there's a bit of metal. Whereas really it is so much like, you know, as, as important as the gaffer, do you know what I mean? Like they're, yeah. they're there to, you know, create emotion in the move, you know, that little slow pushing, you know, and they can, if they can add that or suggest that kind of stuff, it's always going to be so helpful. And, I think you know maybe they've uh, it's sometimes been slightly overlooked on that, but it's you know it's nice to hear. Do you know what I mean that 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 role is looked at that way as well? Oh yeah, I, I think I, I get you know find it hugely um, uh, what's the word? Find it. I find it gives me a big projection into the scene into the day when I yeah. when working with a grip who. Has a real understanding for the storytelling and, and will suggest things that should quite creative led um and may, not just you know solutions but the way that maybe a move adjusts you know when you when you're working with some of the grips who you know can really feel the words or even if, if there's no words can really understand the emotion and what you're trying to communicate yeah and they start doing it for you you know they start adjusting either to the actors they don't they're not just going from a to b and they're not just going to their marks and going to the focus marks yeah. or you know it's it's it really is you know the dynamic could change because the way the actors will move will change you know a classic way of feeling that is obviously on something like a dance floor but the yeah. but it you know like just straightforward linear dolly moves can be really made or destroyed 
by how the dolly moves. Well, and I think it can take a lot, it, yeah. a lot of pressure off yourself. You know, I mean, it's very sometimes it's quite, you know, difficult to try and explain like, you know, because it's not just about it. Like you said, A and B It is. it's on a time. It's on a point. And that, you know, like you said, the actors, sometimes they're not going to play it every exactly the same every take. And it's about noticing it's just not them going one, two and move. It's waiting for that moment and waiting for that pinnacle yeah, point yeah. On, on that shot to move. And, you know, I think if, if everyone else is getting it all right, do you know what I mean? You've spent all this time on the lighting, the actor's nailing it. If the, you know, if that move isn't isn't pinpoint and on the, on that right point, then it's just going to, you know, it's just you're going to have to do another take. So I yeah, think, yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, the, the fear is so, you know, with all, it's the, that's the ballet and the choreography that I apps, I'm sure we all absolutely love. And yeah. it's what makes filmmaking so unique to maybe other some other artistic endeavours, whether it's being a photographer, whether it's being a writer. Yeah. Um, I guess being in a band would be similar um, with music. But, yeah. You know, my fear is like, it's not like shit. I don't want to be the one who fucks it up. But I'm yeah. like, you know, you know, you're doing this, whether it's a scene and whether it's a character's breakdown and it's something that they can, or whether it's just... I, a technical execution, yeah, stylized shot within a scene. If you're the one who fucks it up, yeah. you just you just find it unforgivable. You're just like, oh my god, you know, either either you spoof the operating, or the or or is the, the the camera move if there's a move doesn't work in the same in the way with the operating it should do, or or maybe the actor's done something. And and but if that's the tape, you know, if that's the tape that the director loves. Yeah, it doesn't matter if you're, you know, it doesn't matter if you've said to the script supervisor, "Oh, don't use that one; it's a bit." Yeah, yeah, yeah. It will get used. <laughs> so, so there's always, you know, and because rightly so, the director wants the most, you know, the best performance, and you know what works for the story, so they can forgive yeah. maybe if the camera's bounced, or maybe if maybe even even if a light has dipped, or I don't know. Yeah, so, yeah. So it's always like you. We've always got, haven't we? Sort of, sort of heart in mouth when you know you're approaching a technical shot and the camera has to move, or maybe there's a lights are doing something, or the camera's moving, and then the rush, that feeling yeah. when it comes together, um, especially on commercials. You know, when you're doing like, you know, when you're into doing ten plus takes and it's a technical move. Yeah. And you know you've probably got it before, but the director's really going for it now. And yeah. you could be doing over 20 takes. And you get to the one and you're just thinking, you know it's going to be one, you're just thinking, oh, I just hope we don't fuck this up. Because <laughs> it'll be like, you know, and it's like the yogurt isn't going to muck it up, is it? It's just going to sit yeah, there. Yeah. But for whatever reason, it's, it's uh, and I love that challenge. And, um, and for it to work, it, that relationship, across the department you know with the grip is so rewarding yeah no it's great and i think like you said it's similar to a band or an orchestra do you know what i mean everyone coming together and, and just making it all work on that that perfect shot yeah you know yeah. I mean? yeah definitely that, that's really rewarding when that when that's really singing across you know and it's you know the things going back to being a loader you know when you used to do the, like the do the you know i used to do the jib yeah on uh, dance floors Oh my gosh! Some of the shots that I fucked up there, you know, <laughs> like you know, zoom, you think, that little, you've got the little but, but zoom. Or, or, or the zoom, you know, doing the zoom, doing the zoom, doing the iris, and doing the jib. But they're yeah. wonderful, wonderful things. As a, like a as a young clapper loader to you know, or second AC. If yeah. you're given those responsibilities, you start feeling the pressure. You start feeling the pressure that a focus puller feels every single shot. You start feeling the pressure that an operator feels every single shot and a cinematographer feels on every scene. You know, you 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 start feeling it. And I think it's a bit of a shame that, um, I don't know if these days, def definitely there's less, I don't see ACs on the jib the way they used to be. No. Um, and, but maybe, maybe it's just the world I'm in. I, you know, you know, I'm sure there's still plenty of, grips who who would work with a good ac that way on a dance floor at a particular time but i used to do loads of it I used to do loads of it with uh you know grips and you know pat and we've all these, these yeah. guys and and um god man i used to really feel the pressure you know especially if it was a dance floor and you're going shit are we up here or are we down now i can't remember is it like yeah. which way are we going i'll try this 
And then it'd be like, and you see the operator and their eyes are going, what the fuck's going on? But, <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, doing the Zoom, I remember, <laughs> I remember poor old Richard, first, first scene of this film we were doing, we were in, um, the pan- we were in, uh, Czechoslovakia on the Polish border and we're with the British, we had the British army with us. We were doing the scene on an army base and it was a classic establishing the geography of the world of the world yeah. and everything was moving. So on action, we had warrior tanks going through. We had soldiers moving this way. Right. And we might have had a couple of planes flying. Out. It was everything. It was brilliant. Yeah. And, and the setting up for it took, you know, most of the morning and we'd done, we'd done the, uh, um some uh bunny we've done the um the words on on the scene first and then we're finishing right. with this this big set piece wide shot establishing this whole every you know it's going to take some time yeah yeah and we had it all set up and i remember i was on it was 16 mil and we we're on a there was on a canon what was it eight to 64 i think it was yeah, and, yeah. And, and it was halfway on the lens. It was like, it must've been about 20 mil or something like that. But basically, whatever we were doing, we were going, I think we might've been tightening through a dolly move and then coming round and then widening out to reveal the world as yeah. the tank went past and the plane. And we'd rehearsed it and it was all fine. I had my marks on, on a mic, well, it was on a microphone. It wasn't a digital microphone. Right, yeah, yeah. I knew what, I had my, my arrows and, and we just we went to do the take and it was like eh, you know the first, the first <laughs> thing and instead of zoom instead of zooming in i zoomed out and i remember like you know we're going like the, we're well into you know we're like 20 seconds into the shot and i'm going oh this is beautiful this is beautiful there's no monitor but i'm feeling that i'm feeling the microphone so i'm loving it and now like richard's behind the camera he's sort of looking around at pat so on the dolly <laughs> he's looking at me and he's he's like going like and he's trying to hold the camera set I'm going fuck. And I just went that way, and it went zoomed in, like, you know, <laughs> like cut through the camera. And it was like about a 45 minute reset or something horrendous. And um, yeah, those are the days. Yeah, I mean, but that's I, why. That's why I actually, when it happens to me on my jobs, it just makes me laugh, you know. Yeah, because it does. I say to the, I'd much rather like ACs. You know, I love it when everyone's trying and they're doing the best. And, and when it goes, when it goes wrong, well, I just find it quite funny sometimes. It's probably a responsible thing to say, but you know, yeah. you know, that's what it's about. What well, you can do, you just got to reset, haven't you? So, yeah, man, I'll have a little laugh about it while you reset. Yeah, <laughs> well, it, mate, it's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. I think the time has flown by, but um, yeah. what have you got like coming up? You know, we're coming to, to yeah. well, a hopeful end of lockdown. I mean, were you on anything when it all went, went, yeah, shut? I was on a, a drama in prep that got um, that got that. that uh basically we we're in prep to start shooting in april yeah and unfortunately the drama was season led you know it has to be a, it was a summer project right so we got paid off i got I, no one got furloughed i just got like uh my contract was cancelled i got a week's money right um, which is better than a kick in the nuts i suppose but yeah. the um but that was it and and then was hoping the job was going to go it's supposed to go in july yeah. Now and um, we were all, t- you know, hoping, 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 but what a what a bizarre few months. Anyway, the um, yeah. uh, it got pulled, so that got right. pulled. So, um, but I went back to work three weeks ago now and did a did a car commercial um, with COVID safety implications, and we had we had actors and we had we had quite a bit of work actually it was like six i think i I I can remember seeing some pictures yeah yeah six fifteen seconds and 160 and then we had some some russian arm work a day of russian arm work as well and it all worked really well it was efficient you know it was a feeling of being back on set was brilliant Yeah, yeah everybody you know it was really good everyone was careful but it's kind of like wow that's where we all belong isn't it we just all belong there so um, I had that and I've got a couple of pencils for a couple of things and um, and, I'm, and, I, and I'm starting to get some scripts through now right. to sort of read. So who knows? But it's just it's just, a, you know, it's it's a very um, it's a very unsure world at the moment, isn't it? Yeah. But, um, hopefully we can all have some 
feeling of positivity and that you know hope springs eternal really i think i think it's slowly starting to evolve and yeah i mean i had a couple of days yeah. already and yeah i think it's starting to you know i'm having things come in as well so hopefully it's a sign of good things to come definitely yeah all right man well thank you so much for chatting and Thanks, uh, uh hopefully we can catch up soon definitely yeah wicked all right man. Well, uh, thank you so much it's been lovely lovely talking to you okay Thanks, Speak Cheers, to you. all the best bye man.